So, all right, <clears throat> welcome and thank you for joining us for Columbia Riverkeepers. Love your Columbia webinar series. My name is Karina. I'm the communications coordinator for Columbia Riverkeeper, and I'm incredibly excited for today's webinar, Climate and the Columbia Lessons from the Past for the Future. We're joined today by Dr. Maureen Walzak and Dr. Alan Mix. We're earth scientists at Oregon State University, and we're also joined by Columbia Riverkeeper senior attorney, Miles Johnson. Uh, so, let me actually stop my screen share briefly. I would like folks, if you can, let's get acquainted with the chat for everyone listening. If you could drop in where you're listening from, and uh, oh, someone already did it. Great job, thanks Barry. Uh, where you're listening from and what the weather is like there, if you'd like to share. So if you can just send us your name, where you're listening from, and if you'd like to, what your weather is like, just drop that in the Zoom chat so we all get comfortable using it so we can ask questions. Lacey, very wet, says Judith. <laughs> Sounds about right here. My Ooh. mom lives on Bainbridge Island. Oh, cool. Corvallis, damp. Walla Walla, very wet. Spokane, it's raining. Ooh, partly cloudy, cloudy in the Dallas. Good to hear. I'm going to have to cross the Cascades, get some vitamin D soon. My we have some from Florida. <laughs> What'd you say, Maureen? My favorite place name is Twisp. Twisp. <laughs> Rick from Portland, cloudy some sun. Oh, the sun is coming out. Great, okay. Awesome, thank you everyone. <laughs> Scapoose. <laughs> Albany, Oregon, very cool. All right, so a roadmap for today. We're gonna kick off today's webinar with a land acknowledgement, which is a practice that recognizes and respects indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. Then Alan and Marina are gonna give their very exciting presentation. Uh, I've seen some sneak peeks of it and it's really, really cool. After that, we're gonna have our discussion. So at that point you can throw in questions into the chat. Um, and so if you have a question for Alan, Marine, or Miles, you'll add it to the uh, chat in Zoom or on Facebook Live if you're listening on Facebook. After that, Miles is going to contextualize Alan Marine's work with a short presentation. And today's webinar should run just over an hour. If we go over uh, and you have to jump, don't worry. We're going to send everyone a full recording of this webinar uh, after uh, we're done. And also it'll be on YouTube uh, in perpetuity. You can take a look anytime you want. So starting first with the land acknowledgement. We at Columbia Riverkeeper recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between native people and their native territories, traditional territories. We respectfully acknowledge that the places we are joining today's webinar from rest on the traditional lands of native people who have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial and continue to do so today. I'm joining today from my home in Portland, Oregon, which rests on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who have made their home in this area. All right, so we're gonna kick things off. Dr. Alan Mix in the mix. <laughs> Ready for a screen share, huh? Yep. Okay. That should work and are you seeing? We are, you just have to share uh, events. We're all good to go. Okay, you're seeing a single slide now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes, thanks, Karina. Lovely to be with you and, and everyone out there uh, today. Thanks for the invitation. This will be a bit of a tag team uh, between myself and uh, Maureen. We're both uh, professors here at Oregon State. And um, I will start off, uh, well, I'll give you a little outline. Um, so what, what we'd really like to know is what does the future hold uh, for the Columbia River uh, writ large? And um, we'll, we'll ask uh, first what we know, what we don't know. So I'll, I'll send a little, uh, set up a little frame for it here. Um, and in particular, I'm uh, recently uh, finished uh, with uh, being a lead author for the current uh, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, uh, which just produced its uh, working group one report on uh, on the climate system, which is background to next week's COP26 meeting in, um, in the UK. 
So I'll talk a little bit about what we know from the IPCC, and then I'll, I'll give you some tools that you can use that I think are really cool, you'll find useful, and you can disappear down that rabbit hole uh, at your leisure. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, shift gears, and Maureen will talk about uh, the current project we are just starting um, that is trying to get a frame on how variable the Columbia River system is by looking at the past. Um, so with that, I'll move on and say a few things that probably most of you know, but challenges to figuring out how the system. Uh, and first, there's um, tremendous spatial variability to the system and interannual year-to-year variability in the system. So these are some maps um, that just show the um, uh, the anomalies, the, the differences from normal in, in rainfall over the past few years. And in this, uh, in these set of maps with dates on them, uh, cool colors are wetter than normal and warm colors are drier than normal. And so you can see just very quickly that uh, the rainfall patterns flop around from year to year. And we all know that um, 2021 was pretty droughty, uh, particularly down to the south, um, and uh, especially in California, and uh, was, was not droughty uh, up to the north. But if you look back through uh, other years, uh, you can see, you know, 2019 was pretty wet in the south and uh, drier in the north, and, and so on. So as we seek to look at the big picture of what's going on, we have to see through this year-to-year -year variability that's inevitable and it will continue in the, in the future. Uh, and another thing we, you probably all know is of course there's a seasonal variability in the runoff uh, going into the Columbia River. And uh, the, the best long-term gauging is um, at the Dalles. And so we all know that there's spring and summer runoff, but it's really seeded by uh, winter, winter rainfall and snows uh, that um, then melts in the spring and so on. And so uh, this is the system, what we'd really like to know is about the inputs to the system in um, winter rainfall and then how it propagates through the system to become a uh, river runoff. So we'll be uh, looking at that. And then uh, third, there's year-to-year uh, -year variability, and there is um, a pretty good record, again, from the Dalles, uh, going back over 100 years. And so the blue line here is the record from uh, 1880 uh, through uh, 2020 that shows ups and downs of stream flow as gauged at the Dalles. And uh, a question for the future, we all know about global warming happening in the future, but that doesn't necessarily tell us about rainfall uh, or uh, river flows um, that we want to know in this case. And so um, given that most of the uh, water entering the Columbia system comes from up north, uh, I plotted here the temperature record at uh, Colville uh, up in northern Washington. And uh, in, it's interesting, actually, that the stream uh, runoff, uh, stream flow records are more complete than the temperature records. Uh, but you can see here from the data we have that uh, both are quite variable through time. And uh, but uh, if you look at the correlation between temperature and rainfall, um, they're, they're not highly correlated. And so so that's. Um, a challenge uh, for uh, model predictions of the future, where we can probably do um, temperature a lot better than we can do rainfall. So uh, keep that in mind. The current system is not highly correlated between temperature and um, and rainfall. Okay, the IPCC, the the the, the gig I just just uh, am coming off of, uh, leading toward the. Um, uh, COP26 meeting next week, which will address uh, climate changes for, for governments. Uh, what is the IPCC and what is it not? Well, uh, first of all, it's uh, the IPCC authors um, uh, that come together are uh, volunteers, and their task for the IPCC is to not create the science, but to assess the science. And so our task coming together every six years or so is to read massive amounts of literature. Uh, and, and in fact, over the last six years, there are about 230,000 papers 
um, published that uh, we were tasked with uh, assessing. And it's a large international group from all the participating nations. So there are 250, approximately 250 uh, lead authors. I was just one of them. It's very much a team effort. And I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but uh, up the upper left is the, the report that just came out, the physical science basis. That's work, working group one. There are two more reports coming out. Uh, the second one, which will be out in the winter, is impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And the third one is uh, mitigation of climate change. And then next fall, there will be a synthesis report of the whole thing. So you can think of this as, as the physical science report, the social science report, and the, um, and the engineering report, uh, as, uh, as it were. So, so now we're at the stage of reporting on what the climate system is doing. The next report will be what the climate system is doing to people. And the third will be, what are we gonna do about it? So, um, uh, so that's the frame on what we've reported on so far. And again, we as authors of the IPCC don't create the science, we're, we're reporting on the science and assessing the science to give the best consensus view of, of what you should believe, uh, what, what we find believable and what the uncertainties are. Okay, I'm going to go back to one of the previous uh, IPCC reports. This is circa 2007 and what we know about the Columbia Basin. And with history, uh, history going back from 1900 to 2000 and projection with models going forward to the year 2100. And uh, so there was a strong consensus even, even then. Uh, so now more than 10 years ago that uh, it is going to get warmer in the future with some different scenarios. And uh, in particular, um, if you look to the right uh, for temperature, these are the different seasons. So D, J, F is December, January, February, July, June, July, August is J, J, A. And they're all getting warmer, but uh, there's a little extra warming in the summer. And these are some different, different scenarios that they played out for how um, emissions will occur, carbon dioxide emissions. And then the finding at that time was maybe, maybe it's a little wetter in the future, but it's within the error bar and disagreement of the models. Uh, there is a tendency for summer uh, to be more droughty and winter to be uh, wetter. So the horizontal line here is the zero line. So the, these are differences in change, but there's still a lot of disagreement in, in the different models. And you could argue that we're, we're really not very sure at this point. So the, the idea that has gotten um, uh, into the literature, and it's a perfectly reasonable idea that with warming, uh, we may be a little wetter. And the concept there is a warmer atmosphere just holds more moisture. So there's more moisture to rain out. But uh, the snow runoff will probably melt a little sooner in the spring. Uh, so we might be have more peaked flows and it'd be more droughty in the summer. And so that might be a, a, an issue for water resources uh, in which you have to figure out how to get through the summer when you're losing your water earlier in the year and that gets to, to water management issues. Uh, ooh. There we go. Okay, what's new in the brand new sixth assessment? Well, first of all, we've, uh, the science has progressed quite a lot on the uncertainty issue. Uh, in particular, uh, uh, we've trimmed the range of possibilities in the model. We're, we're more certain on the sensitivity of climate to carbon dioxide. So we've trimmed the, the scenarios of the past, which had basically no change in response to CO2. And there were some like huge disaster scenarios out there, catastrophic results uh, with huge sensitivity to CO2. Those, those tails uh, you could call them tails on a distribution have all uh, gone away. And so we're much more certain about the range um, that um, uh, of how sensitive uh, climate is to carbon dioxide. Next, we've uh, got much more realistic links between emissions and socioeconomic factors. Basically, how does economic development translate into uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So, so now these are called SSP scenarios or socioeconomic pathways effectively. 
And the upshot of all of this is our future is sort of a choose your own adventure uh, book in which the uncertainty now is not so much in the climate modeling, at least on large scales, uh, but the uncertainty is on which emission scenarios we'll, we're going to choose. And so here's temperature going into the future uh, to 2100. The pathway we are on now so far, uh, here we're, we're here about now, uh, is we, we are between the high and medium scenario and uh, with the commitments that governments have made so far, we will probably be in the range of between this SSP2 and SSP3. So think in terms of we're, we're now, if governments live up to their commitments, uh, which uh, honestly they haven't so far, but if they do, um, will be in the three degree range. And that's um, not a great story. What uh, the, the basic finding is that uh, we'd love to keep the limit to within about one and a half degrees. And uh, we're not on that pathway now. And so the, the next uh, few weeks, we'll, we'll say whether the government step up and um, get serious about keeping us on this one and a half degree pathway, uh, or at least below two degrees. So in the report also, there's a lot more emphasis on regional and extreme events. We, we all lived through some big heat waves uh, last summer, and that uh, uh, appears to be a future uh, feature, uh, unpleasant feature uh, that we, we may face in the future. There are still some limits to how finely we can, we can uh, analyze things and how close a prediction we can give for a specific region, but uh, that is improving. Okay, tools you can use. So this is a really cool feature, a rabbit hole you can disappear uh, down. And this is the brand new IPCC interactive atlas where you can go anywhere in the world, uh, zoom in on areas, including river basins and so on uh, with, with some limitations for size. Uh, here's the link, interactive-atlas.ipcc.ch. It's hosted in Switzerland, that's the CH. Um, and uh, so you can pick an area, zoom in, and then get the historical data or all the best available uh, model predictions for the future of all kinds of variables. Um, and you can spend uh, days uh, digging through this. It's meant to be user-friendly and a tool that um, policymakers or interested uh, uh, public can um, um, learn from. Uh, and so I'm going to zoom in on the Western North America. And this is just one of the screen dumps out of that uh, interactive atlas and say, what's going to happen? Uh, and now I, I've projected in a three degree warming scenario because that's the one we've at least at this point committed to. And um, uh, the year 2100 um, uh, is what I've got plotted here. And so what you can see is for winter precipitation, oh, the hashed lines you can see here, that means not statistically significant. So it was no hashed lines, you might believe it. Uh, greener is uh, more uh, wet, wetter, uh, um, greater precip relative to the baseline modern. And, um, uh, and orange uh, or uh, warmer colors are more droughty. And so in the winter, it does say from the Columbia Basin generally, there's, as the previous estimate showed, it's not a lot of change, but wetter uh, in, in the mountainous regions around that might provide some source water. Uh, definitely warmer. Uh, and uh, remember, this is the three degree warming scenario, but you see these dark reddish colors are a lot more than three degrees. They're more like six. Uh, and so um, that is one of the concerns, for example, for snowpack, if winter is uh, significantly warmer in the source areas of water, um, that's going to be a problem because you're going to, uh, the precipitation will fall as rain rather than snow. In summer, it looks pretty droughty uh, down here in the lower left. Uh, so much drier than uh, present and summer temperatures even warmer um, than, um, uh, than the the sense of change for the winter. Uh, so that's bad um, uh, in terms of feeding water into the Columbia River. Of course, we, we know that, that it's already pretty dry in the, uh, in the summer. So um, 
So this is really amplifying the previous knowledge, saying it was reasonable, we're getting a little more certain about it, that um, we may have a little more rain um, in the winter. It's going to be drier in the summer, but that's not the big source, but it is going to be quite a bit uh, warmer. Okay, is that right? So the models, uh, models are saying warmering in both seasons, summer drought and winter may be a little bit wetter, um, but is that right? And so we, uh, we as uh, paleoclimatologists go to things that have actually happened in the past and ask whether that's right. So I'm gonna take you on a quick field trip to Oregon Caves National Monument. Of course, that's not in the Columbia drainage, uh, but it's in sort of the same climate regime. And the question is whether this concept of a warmer atmosphere holding more moisture, therefore delivering more winter rain is, is correct or not. Or there's another scenario, is that do the climate systems just move northward in warming? So does, does Oregon and potentially Washington uh, become more like California, which is both warm and dry? So is, is the winter warm and dry, warmer and drier, or is the winter warmer and wetter? Well, what's cool about Oregon caves is all of the water that drips into the cave falls in the winter. So we have a we can measure in the stalagmites, and I'm going to measure it with uh, oxygen isotopes, and I'm going to gloss over how, but that's highly correlated to temperature. Uh, and so by measuring the layers in the stalagmites, we can say whether it was warmer or cooler going back through time. And similarly, from carbon isotopes, we can say whether it was wetter or drier and its influence on vegetation. And so here's the record. This is the particular stalagmite we sampled uh, with the help of the National Park Service. And we dated it so we know when it is and so on. And here's a record now of te winter temperature, the blue line, and uh, precipitation or moisture availability, the green line, and another one, ocean temperature, which I'm, I won't tell you about uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, and but uh, and this now doesn't go back 100 years, this goes back, well, 13,000 years. So we can get a long baseline perspective on what the variability is. And what this says is that, although it's not a perfect correlation, that winter warming is associated with winter drying. So, so which is that, that alternate scenario that the climate, you know, as climate warms, it becomes more California-like. And if that scenario that plays out as um, winter drying at Oregon Caves applies further north to the Columbia system, well, then, then we've got a serious water resource problem uh, in the future if warmer is actually uh, more droughty, both in the winter and in the summer. Um, that's pretty serious business. So, um, so there we are uh, uh, as an introduction and a regional frame. The models really are holding up and saying that uh, although we have summer drought in the future with warming, uh, that we might have a little, uh, be a little wetter in, in the winter. But the paleo record, at least from Southern Oregon, uh, suggests that winter drought is associated with warming. And so we need to know which one of, that, uh, of those um, is the truth. Uh, at least as it applies further north. So what we really need is a long-term record of uh, Columbia um, water flows. And with that, I'm going to um, pass the baton over to Maureen, and she's going to talk about our project that's trying to do just that, create a long-term, very long-term monitoring of Columbia river flows. So thanks. I'll stop my share and shift to Maureen. Thanks, Alan. See if we can make this work. Can everyone see my screen? Are we looking good? Looks good. Awesome. All right, so I feel like with this audience, it's not gonna be a hard sell that the Columbia is special, but it actually is really special. Um, and, and from a earth sciences standpoint, one of the many things that makes this river drainage pretty unique is that it, um, it punches through these mountain ranges that separate many drainages from the coast. So the, the west coast of North America and of South America um, it is, is um, delineated by these long mountain ranges that run parallel to the shoreline because it's a subduction zone. And so as part of the subduction of the Pacific plate, there's uplift and volcanism, and that creates mountain ranges like the Cascades and the Andes. 
And those mountain ranges effectively isolate a lot of precipitation from the inshore areas. It creates that rain shadow effect. And it also means that a lot of the drainages on our, on our west coast margin are limited from the west side of those big mountains to the ocean. And what's really remarkable about the Columbia is that it, it goes from, from basically the Rockies all the way to the Pacific. It covers a drainage basin of 258,000 square miles, most of the surface area of the Pacific Northwest, no matter how you cut it. And it, as, because of that, it, it forms the largest point source of fresh water into the Eastern Pacific Ocean. So from either North or South America, this is the biggest river to enter this ocean. And as you might expect from that much fresh water being routed through one river drainage, there is an impact on the salinity, on the salt content of the surface ocean adjacent to the river. So this, this graphic over here to the right, can people see my mouse when I move my mouse? Is that effective? Yep, we can see it. All right, so this, this graphic over here to the right, this is kind of a classic view of the salinity of the surface ocean adjacent to the Pacific Northwest. And these contours here are showing um, basically lines of constant salinity. And so as you move from, from this point source here, this is the Columbia out towards the open ocean, these contours, the numbers are getting higher and higher and the water is getting more and more saline. And what you can see is that in the summertime, there's this plume that extends over a hundred miles offshore and sort of bends around to the south along with the prevailing winds and currents. And then in the wintertime, that plume gets confined and pinned much closer to the shoreline and travels up along the Washington coast towards Haida Gwaii. Uh, so, so the the positive thing for us as paleoclimate scientists is that there is then an opportunity here to potentially go back and understand the changing discharge of the Columbia River by trying to reconstruct the salinity in the adjacent surface ocean back through time. And one major advantage of doing this in marine sediments, as opposed to trying to do the reconstruction from terrestrial records, is that marine sediments are accumulating out here kind of like pages in a book. So there's always mud in the ocean. The Columbia River along with that fresh water is delivering a lot of sediment. And those sediments are being carried out to the ocean. And then when they, when they reach quiet enough water, they settle down. And, and just like a, you know, a, sturdy, a stirred up mud puddle after you drive through a mud puddle, it's all muddy. And then you, you wait for a few minutes and it settles down and the water becomes clear again. So that process is happening in the ocean all the time. The sediments are always accumulating on the bottom. And over long periods of time, they just continue to build up. And they carry with them geochemical and biological information about what was happening in the ocean and in the adjacent river systems at the time that they were, they were deposited. So ideally now I move forward, yay. <laughs> so so we, we, we went out to go and, and, and try and um, sample some of these, these sediment archives, these, these histories that are contained in the mud using state ship time that, that was um, provided by actually the Oregon State Legislature. So we, we got a few days here, a few days there, cobbled it together with, with donor funds from Oregon State University um, and some support from the National Science Foundation. And we, we've been able to pull together a couple of, of good cruises where we've gone out to collect these muds. And so this is, this is the you know, obligatory pictures of, of happy students having their seagoing experiences. And it, it is, Alan's mentioned this, but it is really worth mentioning that this kind of earth science is very collaborative. So you don't have one scientist that goes out in cowboys and does everything on their own. The, the, the kinds of teams that are required to accomplish this kind of science, it takes tens of people or hundreds of people. And this is just a, an example of, of some of the wonderful um, students and, and faculty and researchers who have been involved in these efforts, as well as I think we've got one very enthusiastic deckhand here. That was the only, only core we collected on that cruise. So we, we took a picture with it. Um, so, so how do we do this? Uh, we, we collect these archives using something called jumbo piston coring. So um, a piston core, a, a core to start with, is just um, a small sample of what's down there that's collected through a pipe. So you can kind of imagine if you took a, took a straw and shoved it into a layer cake and then put your thumb on the straw and pulled the straw out of that layer cake and got a, a small sample of what was in that cake without having to actually cut the whole cake open and see whether it was jam or buttercream frosting in the middle layer. That's kind of what we're doing, but with mud and with really big straws. Uh, so this, this is uh, images showing what piston coring looks like on the Oceanus. This here is the head of the piston core. So this weight weighs a few thousand pounds. And then this is a steel pipe that extends down below that. We call this the core barrel. And we, we crane that out over the ship and drop the barrel down. And then we lower it into the ocean. I'm going to show you a little video. We, we strapped a GoPro to one of our barrels this summer. 
This is actually a cruise in the Gulf of Maine, but it's by far the coolest um, coring video I have. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, hello, shark. That's a, a blue shark. You, you know the ocean's alive out there, but it's really fun to see these reminders that, you know, even when we're out there sampling mud, we are interacting with animals. Um, so, so we go out there, we collect these, these cores, that pipe continued down to the bottom of the ocean, slammed into the sediment, collected that, that big chunk of layer cake, and then the piston was the thumb on top of the straw that pulled it all back up to the ship, and then we extruded those sections. So once we get that mud back to the ship, what can we do with it? Um, so the, the sediments that are out in the ocean are composed of a combination of what we call lithogenic, which means from rock, and biogenic, which means from biology components. And, and using the combination of those constituents, we can reconstruct things like ocean salinity or the salt content of the ocean, uh, ocean temperature or the heat content of the ocean. We can learn things about nutrient, cy nutrient cycling. So nutrients are chemical compounds that are important for and influenced by biology. And they're particularly important for primary producers. So the tiny plants that live in the ocean, which are the basis of the whole food web out there. Um, and then we can also use these constituents to, to understand changes in the primary productivity and the overall productivity of the ocean. So the biological abundance and diversity of, of organisms that are out there. Um, when I'm talking about organisms in the sediment, these pictures over here are showing what I'm, what I'm talking about. So this picture on the upper right is showing uh, images of diatoms. Diatoms are tiny marine plants. Uh, they're barely visible to the naked eye, even the big ones. Um, if they form larger colonies, then you can see them pretty clearly, but most of them are quite small. And they, they make little houses out of, um, out of silica dioxide or, or glass. It's basically glass. They live in little glass boxes. And those frustules or those shells protect them from the outside. And then, and then on the inside, the plant does all of its business. And um, when they die, the soft parts of the plant decay away, but those glass houses and then also the chemical constituents that were contained in them are preserved. And so if we go back through sediments and sieve them out and look at the species of diatoms there, we can infer what kinds of conditions promoted the growth of certain species. Just, just like other organisms, micro animals and micro plants, they have habitat preferences, right? So you wouldn't expect to see a polar bear in a jungle and you wouldn't expect to see a howler monkey in the Arctic. And, and so these, these fossilized plant remains are the same kind of thing. We're looking, we're looking for organisms that have tolerances that prefer lower salinities, higher salinities, warmer temperatures, colder temperatures. And then we can back up what the ocean was like at the time that they died. Uh, similarly, below this, this is an image of foraminifera. Foraminifera are tiny marine calcifiers. Um, they're protista or protist, which is a different kind of life than animals or plants. They're single-celled organisms. And they make little shells out of calcium carbonate. Not all of them do, but the ones that we're really interested in do. And so these calcium carbonate shells, calcium carbonate is the same material that you would see in, in chalk or it's the active ingredient in Tums. Um, it's actually kind of interesting because calcium carbonate dissociates pretty readily when acidity increases, which is another kind of impact of CO2 changing in the, in the oceans. We're, we're changing the acidity of our surface ocean, which makes these marine calcifiers really unhappy. But at, for right now, these calcifiers are ubiquitous in the, in the world's oceans. They live in, in surface uh, waters. They live down at the benthos scavenging. Um, they have a variety of different ways of making a living. And, and again, their shells are preserved in the sediments and we can go back and see who was living there what they were making those shells out of, and then infer important things about, about the state of the ocean at the time that they were alive. Um, the last thing that we can learn from the sediments actually comes from the lithogenic part or the, the rocky part of the sediment themselves. So from the, from the composition of the rock, the chemical composition of the rock, we can infer the source of the sediment, what was being eroded and transported by the rivers or glacial systems that were carrying that sediment to the ocean. Um, and then we can also infer things based on the grain size of those sediments and how well sorted they are and the structures that we see in those sediments, what the delivery me mechanisms were. And I think what, what that looks like will become clearer in a second here. Um, so this image over here, this is a, this is a little, uh, I guess, turbidity current in a box. And so what, what this GIF is showing is a, a slurry of very muddy water being released into clear water. And can you see how that very muddy water is sticking to the bottom of that tank and rolling downhill under its own gravity, not really mixing up too much? So, so this is something called a hyperpycnal flow. And basically the density of that muddy water is really high relative to the surrounding water. And so it has its own gravity and it rolls downhill and it can actually become quite energetic and quite erosive at the bottom. 
And when this thing eventually lands and settles out, it'll create a really characteristic deposit where the coarse stuff in that flow will settle out first, and then the fine stuff will settle out up to the top. So there's, there's a, it, these are really easy to identify these kinds of currents. And these are the kinds of currents that are released to the ocean during big flood states. So they can, it can be either during seasonal flood states. It can also happen during mega floods, like the kinds that carve the Columbia Gorge. Um, and you can also get turbidity currents associated with submarine landslides and things like that. But that's just something to think about in this next slide. These, these turbidity currents have a really distinctive signature in the mud. Um, so as I mentioned, those turbidity currents can be erosive. And so we kind of want to stay away from where they are confined to. Again, they're, they're, they flow downhill under their own gravity. Um, and so these canyon systems out here, it turns out, are the major conduits for where those turbidity currents go. So to orient you, this is the, this is the Columbia, this is Astoria here coming out across the continental shelf. This dashed line here is showing roughly what we call the shelf break. So this is, this is the edge of the continental shelf. And then below that is the continental slope. And the, the sediments that we're collecting are predominantly on the continental slope. And the, and the reason for that is that during low stands and sea level, a lot of this continental shelf was actually subaerial. So when the, I went at the Lake Pleistocene during the last glacial maximum, ice sheets were as big as they could be, this, this continental shelf here would have been a coastal plain and it wouldn't have been experiencing marine sedimentation. And it, it's all quite complicated from a paleo environmental standpoint. So, so we collect records that are down here on the continental slope. And we don't want to be right in these big canyon systems, which act as drainages for these big rivers, particularly during sand, low stands and sea level. We want to be kind of adjacent to them and a little bit out of the fire hose. And so we're, we're going to look at some cores that have been collected in these quiet deposits that are that are just a little bit off to the shoulder of the action, but still still sensitive to it, hopefully recording everything, but not having those erosive flows that, that destroy and remobilize sediment. Hey, Maureen, I want to, can I interrupt you for a second? Yes. We have a question in the chat from Omar, and it's um, they're wondering what the mud flow is called again. Is that the turbidity current or is it? Yeah, it's called a turbidity current. Gotcha. And when it, when it, so the turbidity current is the flow, or it can also be called a hyperpycnal flow, although hyperpycnal flows don't have to have mud. Um, but when you, when you get a hyperpycnal flow that is caused by high density associated with a lot of mud or sediment being carried in the, in the water, then that would be a turbidity current. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Turbid, like murky. Gotcha. And then, um, so this, this here, these are, these are sediment cores that we collected out there. And to, to orient you, this is the, the top of the very top of the core. Remember those core pipes were really long, right? Like 10 meters long, 20 meters long. And we can't carry cores that big back to shore in one piece. It just wouldn't be possible. We wouldn't be able to study them, store them, analyze them. It's, it's too much in one chunk. So we have to set, cut them into smaller chunks. So what we do is we cut that core into smaller sections, starting from the bottom. The 150 centimeters is kind of the practical maximum length. It's about as much mud as, as one graduate student can carry. Uh, it's also about the right length for, for all of our track systems that we use to analyze these things. And our, our repositories where we store the muds are all tailored to that length. So we start at the bottom of the core and we cut off 150 centimeter section, and then we cut off another 150 centimeter section, and then another, can you see what I'm doing here, moving towards the top? So this here is the very, very bottom of that pipe. This little, this little indentation here is from the core catcher that was at the bottom of the core. And then this is the section above that, the section above that, so on and so forth, until you get to the very, very top of the core, which is usually kind of a weird length because you to get what's left after you cut off your approximately 150 centimeter chunks. Um, so this is the this is the surface mud. This is the mud that was deposited when we were, you know, eating breakfast last year. And this is the mud that was deposited when mastodons were charging across North America. Um, and so what you can see here, going from the top to the bottom, again, remember the bottom here hooks up to the top here, the bottom here hooks up to the top here, is that there's kind of two flavors of mud that we're seeing out there. One flavor of mud, is it possible for me to annotate? Can I annotate? I can annotate. Watch me, science. Okay. So one flavor of mud, the kind of mud that we're seeing up in these top sections, here again, sort of up here, this mud is really fine grained. And that fine grained mud does not have a lot of structure. The structure that it does have these like little, what we call laminations here, these structures are, are probably associated more with low bottom water oxy oxygenation and like less um, activity from infaunal burrowers as opposed to big turbidity current type sedimentary structures. And then in the, in the older parts of the core, we see something quite different. So in this oldest part of the core here, you can see that we have these, these big bright, uh, these, this, is a, this is a CT scan. So this is just kind of like a CT scan that you would see of a bone or a body. The bright colors are the denser material. 
So the, these big bright layers that you're seeing in this older part of the core, these are, these are dense materials that are being deposited. And this is what the tail of a turbidite cur current would look like. So these are probably periods where very big floods are coming down um, through those canyon systems and being deposited on the margin. Some of these floods are certainly the Missoula mega floods. Another kind of interesting thing that we can see in this, in this older part of the core, the glacial part of the core, see, I have to, now I have to go back to mouse. Here we go. All right, yeah. So uh, in the older part of the core here, can you see these really bright dots? So these bright dots are rocks that are being rafted out into the ocean by icebergs. This is actually a core up by Quinault Canyon. And you can see, see how this, this rock here actually dented the layers below it when it fell down? So basically these are, these are stones that are frozen into glacial ice and that glacial ice is being calved off the margin and then, and then it's floating out into the ocean. And as it's floating out there, it's melting. And then these rocks are, are raining down on the seafloor. And it's, we call this ice rafted debris. But this is, this is a great indication that we're in a world with an ice sheet. A world with an ice sheet is a really cool world. There's lots of awesome science we can do with this and, and lots of neat things we can learn about the formation of the Columbia Gorge and, and ice sheet processes. But for the purposes of the research that we're, we're really honing in on today, we wanna focus on these, these uppermost sediments. So these uppermost sediments were deposited during the Holocene, which is the 10,000 year period during which there have been no big ice sheets, climate's been relatively stable, our orbital configuration has been pretty similar to today. And so looking at climate oscillations that happened during this period of, of, of stable climate, during which many civilizations arose, um, is, a, is, a, is a, good, it's a good analog for understanding our near future. I gotta clear all my scribbles. Um, so, so what are some preliminary results that we're seeing from these cores? So, so this graphic up here is showing the weight percent of fresh water diatoms. FWD is fresh water diatoms. And so, you know, I, I showed that graphic that showed the diatoms before. Not all the diatoms that are in these sediments are marine. Some of the diatoms that we're finding in these sediments were actually transported out from lacustrine or from riverine systems. These diatoms might live for a little while in the ocean, but they can't reproduce there. So basically all the freshwater diatom species that we're finding in these cores have to be associated with discharge coming out of the Columbia River. And Alan uh, years ago did some, some really great foundational work looking at the distribution of freshwater diatom abundances relative to the salinity contours on this margin. So these are, these are from core top samples, basically a, a broad distribution of very short cores where they just analyzed the uppermost sediments. And then they looked at the, the weight percent of freshwater diatoms, and then they compared that to the, to the average salinity of the waters overhead. And what they found is that once you get out into the open ocean, you might get two to 5% freshwater diatoms kind of making it out there. But when you're right, right in the you know, very mouth of the Columbia, you might get up to 20% of freshwater diatoms associated with, with flows that are coming out of that river system. And so they were able to correlate that. They, they found a pretty neat relationship between annual salinity and freshwater diatom percentage. And what I wanna draw your attention to is that this, this, this range, which encompasses the modern margin, is, is pretty different from the range that we're seeing in this, in this uh, sediment that's being collected going back in time off the Columbia. So again, 20,000 years ago, there was an ice sheet here. There were really big catastrophic floods coming down. It's maybe not surprising that there were periods where we got up to 50% freshwater diatoms being deposited on the margin. What's really remarkable is that over the last 10,000 years, there are periods where the freshwater diatom abundance exceeds 30, 40, 50%. So what this is suggesting to us is that even in a period of relative climate stability, the Columbia is a very dynamic system. And this is the kind of variability that we would expect more from the Oregon Caves records than what we would expect from our, our future climate model. We're seeing a really dynamic behavior, a river that's very sensitive to climate change, and, and we're interested in digging into that further. So where do we go from here? Uh, again, we're interested. There, all the evidence suggests that this system is dynamic, that it is responding actively to changes in climate in the past, and that it will respond actively to changing climate in the future. Our, our overarching goal with this study, which is ongoing, is to better understand the relationship between climate change and the hydrology of the Columbia, with the goal to come up with products that are actually gonna be useful for, for good water management and, and policy decisions. And, and again, part of the reason that we're, we're giving this talk today is we want your input. We want involvement from members of this community, from stakeholders. We want to know what kind of research will help in, in making the right decisions for how to, how to protect and, and manage this river system. 
Alan, you want to jump in and help me? I told you I get tongue tied. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you, Maureen. This is awesome. All right. Can we stop sharing so that Miles can go, or want to do questions? Uh, yeah, let's uh, let's stop the sharing so we can kind of have a chat with our faces on on here. So, um, listeners, if you have questions you want to drop in the chat, please do. Um, I kind of want to bring this conversation to uh, more like nuts and bolts, right? So we're seeing uh, Alan, based on your presentation, that uh, would it be accurate to say that, that you know, with more drought and drought related issues in the summer, we're going to see more fire and things like that. Can you extrapolate on that or? Uh, well, yeah, it wouldn't be surprising that if some, somebody commented they liked the word droughty. <laughs> so I'll use that word. If it, you know, more droughty obviously is uh, has more potential uh, for fire. Uh, it's not necessarily a one to one correlation, and we're not trying to predict fire, but actually, that's an interesting point. We can look for things. Uh, in the sedimentary record that Maureen is talking about, uh, like charcoal <laughs> or, or organic molecules that are reflective of charcoal. We can look at traces that uh, I think there's potential here for understanding a long-term basin scale history of fire. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a cool point. Thank you for bringing it up. And we might uh, have a look for that. Yeah, that's, that's, that would be fascinating, I think, to a lot of people. Um, and then off the, the, there's a six, a predicted six degree change in the summer in some areas. That's accurate, right? Um, so Dep depending on the emission scenario, depending on the emission scenario, yeah. so we, so, may do, we hope we do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> but so say, you know, we, we, we have this emission scenario, we have a six degree change. Would the events like the heat dome that we experienced this summer in Portland, become more of a lived reality on a more day-to-day -day basis, potentially? Uh, yeah, so um, there is a, a, a piece of the, the IPCC report that goes into some of this short-term variability. And there is a prediction, I think actually some of that is in that interactive atlas to explore about prevalence of heat waves. And uh, I can't remember if uh, uh, exactly for the Columbia or you know Pacific Northwest area if this holds. But the idea was that although they can't predict individual events, that they uh, they can say the probability of future events. And so uh, so as you go forward, you know, toward the end of this century, I think the prediction is something like four times more probability of events. So you could think about whether, you know, the la this last summer we saw, you know, a week or, or, or two of, you know, some really ridiculously hot weather. And so you could say, you know, maybe you would see four times that much or, or have a probability of seeing four times that much, not necessarily every year uh, and uh, not predictable in detail, but a higher probability of that kind of thing happening. Gotcha, thank you. Um, we had a question in the chat here. Let me see if I can find it. Us uh, from Jim. Uh, Mo, I think referring to Maureen, that's your nickname. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you seen any changes in sedimentation since Bonneville and the earlier Columbia dams went in? I think that's a really interesting question that relates a little bit to Miles' work as well. That actually is a really interesting question. So um, that kind of goes back to uh, work that's been ongoing at University of Washington since the 1980s. They've been monitoring the, the sediment that's accumulating out on the Columbia's mid-shelf mud belt. And um, what they do is they, they use a, a radiogenic called lead 210, which basically accumulates in excess in surface sediments and then decays away with about a 22 year half-life. And so it creates this really distinctive decay profile until it gets to a background level in the sediments. And they, they use the slope of that profile to reconstruct how fast the surface sediment is building up over the course of about a century. And so that's kind of the perfect tool for looking for impacts of dams. And actually as a master's student, I went out to see if we could see a change. My, my master's supervisor had done a lot of work out there in the eighties and found that, that the profiles were steady state accumulation, which means that you couldn't see the impact of the damming and decreased sedimentation rates on the mid-shelf mud belt at that time. Um, and so I went out to see if we could see an impact. And uh, the short story is that we couldn't. Um, this, the profile still looks steady state. And then we went up behind the dams and tried to core behind the dams. Uh, I, I had to get like extensive permitting to be able to do this. And actually 
Um, so like the day that they would let me go up and pour behind the dams, I, I, I still don't think that this was entirely an accident. They decided that they were going to flush the dam on the day of my permit and almost blew us out of the water. <laughs> but they made, but they made a, they made quite the point. So when they flushed the dam while we were out there with our little raft and our pouring device and, and, you know, almost <laughs> sank us, uh, they, they illustrated that the, the flows behind those dams during the flushing are really, really high. And so it seems like on the Columbia, very much unlike the smaller dam systems that we see in the coastal ranges like the Elwha, the Columbia is not retaining as much sediment behind those dams as it could be just because of how energetic things get when they drain those huge reservoirs. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I guess like the short answer is, will we expect an impact? Yes. Have we found that impact yet? No. I can jump in on that too. Out in the places where we've been taking those samples, seeing the details of year-to-year -year details of the last uh, you know, 50, 100 years it, it is pretty difficult because um, benthic organisms sort of wander around on it and, and mess it up unless it's accumulating really, really rapidly. Um, but one of the things we have been looking for for evidence of how sediment is retained is about 500 years ago was the landslide that formed the Bridge of the Gods that dammed up the river for a while and then eventually broke through, of course. And uh, that's something we might be able to see out there. We haven't found it yet, but uh, it's a super interesting question to see whether we can actually trace from the amount of mud that shows up out there to what the river is doing in terms of eroding or retaining sediment. Another, another great project, Not, yet another student to work on it. Huh? Yeah, you're getting a lot of ideas out of this. Um... I had a, where was this? Okay, so this is Diane Barton from Critfic. Um, and this may be a, a little bit of a reach. I don't know how much of uh, your research covered this, but I think it's also very interesting. Um, do you think the dynamic nature of the Columbia may be responsible for the evolution of six species of salmon in the Pacific Northwest versus possibly a more steady Atlantic system with one species of salmon? Thinking that dynamics required more adaptability. What an interesting question. Any thoughts? It's a super interesting question. I have no idea. Miles, do you have thoughts? Oh, I'm, I'm not as much of a yeah, fish head as I need to be to answer that question, but it is, it's certainly an interesting one. The, um, the, you know, the changes in the system that have caused, you know, that have happened relatively quickly and the evolution of all uh, of a range of salmonids that we you know we don't see in other places is a really interesting question i i would have met we probably need another webinar to, yeah, to deal with that another that's, topic. that's let me let me leave it at that before i really embarrass myself <laughs> uh, wayne's question go ahead yeah I've noticed a couple of questions popping up asking about whether or not we could be seeing submarine landslide effects or earthquake events, things like that showing up in these cores. And the short answer is absolutely. And the second answer is we've been very careful to avoid them. So those deposits are certainly out there and in the thou legs of those canyon systems, like th those canyon systems, to think of the scale, those are like the, the Columbia Gorge underwater. The walls of them are hundreds of meters high. They're enormous. So in those canyon systems, the sediments that are accumulating in there are very much impacted by earthquake events and, and they have landslides that move through there routinely. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to find places where sediments are sort of quietly accumulating away from all of that, that big action. And in the sediments that we have, you know how I showed you the Holocene sections that were really fine grained and didn't have a lot of structures in them. So there have been over 20 great earthquakes on this margin over the last 10,000 years. And those 20 earthquakes have produced 20 really distinctive turbidite deposits that you can see out in those canyon systems and trace them all the way down to, to Northern California, moving through those channels. And we don't see those earthquakes in these cores. That does not mean that these cores weren't sedimenting when those earthquakes were there. There certainly would have been a turbidite tail that would have quietly formed during those events. But then the bioturbators, the organisms that Alan's talking about that chew through the structures, those bioturbators out in the slope just ate through that deposit and made it disappear. And so what, what we can say is that even though these earthquakes were happening, the big structures that we're seeing in the core deeper are something different. There's something that's much bigger than the earthquakes. 
in terms of the turbidites and, and, and the sediments that were accumulating during that period of time, we have some radiocarbon chronologies and we know that the sediments were accumulating very, very fast. So th those structures are more related to ice sheet type processes. Cool, very, very cool. Uh, we had a question from Laura. Is the sediment you found uh, when the dams were flush radioactive? And I think that may tie oh, in yes. all <laughs> my questions. Uh, also, yes. like, are you able to see like the history of pollution in the Columbia when you gather? this data? Yeah, I mean, the radiogenics from Hanford are a lot of radioisotopes sorbed to the surface of clay particles. And so um, a lot of that pollution is, is transferred along with the clays. So wherever those clays are accumulating, that pollution accumulates with them. And you can certainly see the, the we call them exotic isotopes that were introduced to the system um, by Hanford out there still. Things like radioactive cobalt and stuff that wouldn't be there naturally. All right. Um, and so I kind of want to start steering this towards Miles' presentation, which will cover some of the, the issues with dams and salmon. Um, what's the future of water management in the Columbia, as, as you, if, if you want to put your pundit hat on? Uh, like, what, what happens if we have less water later in the year, if, the, if our flows start melting much earlier? Who are you asking on that one? Everyone. Oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's certainly, a, a, I think it's a question if Miles is going to talk about dams, you know, uh, obviously, if you're trying to run agriculture there, you want water through the summer. And if you've got less water availability, uh, then then there's an issue to discuss. It's a really complex issue. Uh, you know, I think some of the, it, some of the issue here is, uh, and again, Miles, I'll, I'll defer to, but uh, so some of the water rights are were defined early on and are based on assuming the system is constant, and um, and uh, you know if water is allocated from a system that's constant and then it changes, well then then there you got a problem. And so what our research is showing is that the natural system, uh, you know, undammed system, is extremely variable and uh, more variable than perhaps we thought. And you know there's a lot. A lot of work to be done still to sort that out for sure, but um, that then turns into an issue, uh, and perhaps a legal issue, on how you deal with water rights when you assumed it wasn't variable. And with that, I would totally pass to, to Miles to discuss that issue. Maybe that's the segue. Yeah, I think that's our segue, and we're we're going to go a little bit over an hour, everyone. But I think we're having a great right. time. So, Miles. All right, let me. What. <laughs> Segue. Um, yeah, I think it makes it really interesting to think about the future. Um, and of course, it's that's why your guys' research, research is so important, important and fascinating to get this right. Um, you know, are we going to have more, the same amount of water at different times? Or are we going to have less water overall? Um, you know, what the future is, I, I think, is about what we do with the water we have is, of course, a policy choice. Um, we're in the middle, <laughs> we, the, you know, the United States and Canada are in the middle of renegotiating kind of the treaty that governs um, how water is stored in the upper Columbia and released uh, into, um, into the United States. It's a big complex treaty that involves water storage and reservoirs in Canada in exchange for electricity coming from the Columbia River. Um, you know, I think this kind of research and understanding is really important to, um, you know, to those kinds of planning and agreements. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think some of the short term uh, interests are probably, uh, are, you know, may get in the way of of doing what's what's best in the long term there, but um, you know I think that's probably true of a lot of a lot of our climate policy. Um, you know, switching to um, dams on the Lower Columbia and Lower Snake River, uh, th those dams don't really store water. Um, so the uh, you know it's not so much a question of, you know, how are those dams going to help us adapt? Um, it's more of a realization that, um, you know, the electricity we get from those dams is going to probably become 
harder to predict as we enter um, an unknown um, climate future where we may be getting different amounts of water um, at different times. And in fact, the, you know, the Snake River dams, I, I think dam proponents, one of the, one of the, th the arguments in favor of keeping Snake River dams is, oh, this power is really predictable. We can get it when we, when we need it true because you can kind of turn the dams on and off at will but what we can't do even really as well as we can predict you know the amount of power we'll get in in a year from wind or solar is predict the amount of water we're going to have in our rivers each year um, to generate electricity um, and so in, you know in that way some of these these resources that we've thought of as you know more or less predictable are going to become less predictable um, you know, I see, I see we're at our hour, um, and uh, yeah, I don't I don't know. Um, I think we should take us through the quick part about salmon and hot water because I think that'll be okay. I'll, I'll just share my um, um, my slides here and go through them real quickly, um, and then close if that's. Well. Yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll do your presentation. I'll bring us home. So. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, this is the the short version. I promise. Um, what does what Columbia Riverkeepers work have to do with, with climate change? Well, we think a lot. Um, we work to address climate change head on by, um, by working to stop fossil fuels and kind of re wean ourselves off of fossil fuels that are putting, in this, putting us in this place. Um, in large part because climate change is gonna have a big impact on water quality in the Columbia River, which is something, you know, which is why we're here, most directly because salmon need cold water to survive. Um, you know, it, it's not probably surprising to anyone that the Columbia River is getting warmer uh, year over year. This is kind of a graph of summer water temperature over the last 50 years. And, you know, as you can see, it's getting warmer. Some of that is due to climate change. Um, but we've done a lot of stuff to the river in the last 50 years, including um, four dams on the Lower Snake and four dams on the Lower Columbia. Um, this is McNary Dam. And as you can see, what a dam does, what these dams do to the river um, is to spread out the water, um, create a large, relatively shallow pool with a lot of surface area that soaks up a lot of heat. Um, you know, we can... Did we lose miles? Dams are um, developed. Hey, Miles, you're going in and out. Uh, this modeling right now, but um, the you know the upshot is that without the four dams on the Lower Snake River, that stretch of river would be cool enough for salmon to survive. Whereas now um, it's often not. As in, um, you know, we saw major die-offs of fish in 2015 and this year and really in a lot of years. Um, and so why, why is Columbia Riverkeeper advocating Snake River Dam removal? Um, you know, because of what I just said, it would keep that stretch of river cool enough for fish to, even in really hot years like 2015, like this year, like we're probably going to see more often um, it would keep that stretch of the river survivable. And if those fish can make it through there, they can actually make it into the mountains of Idaho, which are, which contain a lot of high quality spawning habitat um, and are at high elevation. So they're probably going to remain cool enough um, even, even through some level of climate change. Um, you know, the consequence of not doing that is what we saw this summer, fish uh, getting stuck in the lower Columbia because the water is too hot to move upriver 
Um, these are sockeye uh, in the Columbia Gorge that were, you know, becoming diseased and dying because they're stuck in hot water. So real quickly, where are we headed? Um, what can you do about it if you feel inclined? Um, so right now, I think we're in the middle of a campaign to remove four dams on the Lower Snake River. Um, and it's, uh, it's going better than it ever has before. People have been uh, opposing these dams since before they were built and basically since they were built. And right now, I think we have more attention on this issue, more commitment from leaders in the Northwest and the Biden administration to at least, you know, recognize that Snake River dams are a problem and talk about finding ways to replace the services they provide. Um, you know, right now we've got positive statements from the Biden administration, Senator Murray, Senator Wyden, Senator Merkley, Representative Simpson, Representative DeFazio, Governors Kate Brown, Governor Inslee. Everyone seems to be on board with the idea that this is a problem to be solved and the idea that we have a limited time to solve it. Um, if, if you want to get involved, I will, you know, you can sign up to be a Riverkeeper member. If you're not already, we will um, probably inundate you with requests for uh, take action and, and other things. Uh, but if you were going to do one thing today, I would say, you know, and I don't ask this lightly because I know it's not a very empowering call to action, but right now is a time when your voice going to your senators and Congress people is really important. Um, you know, they understand this is a problem. They understand that we need, you know, not just to rip the dams out, but to craft a durable solution. But what they really need to hear from people in the Northwest is that this is, that Snake River Dam removal is important to them. Um, frankly speaking, I don't think they've heard that message loudly enough yet. Um, and the success or failure of the current attempt for Snake River Dam removal in the next year, I think has a lot to do with people picking up the phone and saying, dear Senator Merkley, dear Kate Brown, dear, um, dear Senator Patty Murray, this is really important to me. This is important to the Northwest. Please solve this. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, Alan and Maureen, really interesting stuff. So, um, yeah, appreciate it. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, my my takeaway is someone newer to the environmental movement, um, worked in politics and social justice before this is it. You know, our, our first presentation is we had this enormous catastrophe on the horizon and um, we can make policy choices that, you know, might bend that curve as we've been hearing a lot in different contexts this year, or uh, we can continue doing the same thing and see uh, conditions worsen. Uh, and we have that contrasted that, you know, seemingly enormous problem that, you know, can be fixed with good policy or, or at least mitigated with it in contrast where with the lower snake dams, we have an opportunity to really make an enormous difference. And it's, it's completely doable. And our elected leaders have said that they will create a process um, and we need to, we need to hold them to it. And so, you know, we'd really appreciate your voice on that petition to, um, our electeds and, and, and keep the pressure up because this could be a huge victory that's, you know, 20, 25 years in the making ever since those, even longer since those dams came in. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, if you're not already a member of Columbia Riverkeeper, we really encourage you to join. Your uh, monthly contribution allows us to go into areas before we have grant funding and allows us to be incredibly agile and also provide you with excellent programming like this that I hope uh, that you enjoyed. Uh, so please keep an eye on your email. We'll send you a full recording of this webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, I believe uh, we'll talk about adding some contact information to that thank you email that you'll be receiving. So if you have any questions that didn't get answered, we will get them answered for you. All right. I hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining Columbia Riverkeeper.